Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Behind the Screen. I am your host as usual, Jason Azevedo from Realmsmith, and this is your spoilerific view of what happens behind the screen. Uh, am, I, am I getting double here? Because um, I'm hearing myself in the other room. I just want to make sure that I'm not getting double audio right now. Uh, I guess not. Let me just go turn that off. Okay, I'm good. So what I'm going to do, folks, is we're actually going to give you a tour of the Abbey of St. Markovia build that I have in front of us. So we're going to do that for a bit, and then we'll answer some questions as well. Uh, so let's go to the overcam, and I'm just going to have you guys take a look at that while I go and find out what is doing what it's doing over here. Hopefully you guys can still hear me okay. Uh, give me a thumbs up, folks, if all is good. That was so weird. I'm still getting doubled audio. Hang on. Now we're good. Okay. Figured it out. All right, folks. So we're going to give you a bit of a tour, like I said. Um, I'm kind of stuff. And I think, I think you guys will enjoy this. If this is something you enjoy, let's try it out. Um, and then let me know how you feel about it. Uh, and if this is something that you'd like to do more in the future, where we kind of show you um, what we do and how we do it at Realmsmith and kind of give you a real behind the scenes, take off the top of some of the areas that the players didn't get to. Uh, this is, just to tell you guys know, this is a bit of a spoiler warning for the Abbey of St. Markovia. So those of you that are playing, I'm not going to give away too much of the plot, but I will show you some areas that the players didn't get to. Uh, it will, It is not a spoiler for Into the Mist because they may come back to the Abbey, but probably not. So if my players are watching, don't tune in. But uh, I just before I take down this whole thing, um, I want to make sure that you guys have a look at all of the hard work that we put in at Realmsmith that my players just don't care about is really what it comes down to. All right, so uh, I'm also going to keep my eyes on uh, the questions here and in the chat uh, to make sure that if you guys have questions about the build as we kind of go through here uh, that you ask them uh, and we make sure that we get some answers for you. Uh, and I will try my best to kind of answer them as we go. Let's see here. Okay. All right. Yeah, Bridezilla. Okay, so start off. starting off, this is the um, outer courtyard, or uh, rather kind of the... I can't remember what they call it exactly in the book, but this is the other area. I am sorry for shaky cam i apologize for shaky cam i do not have a steady cam in order to do this so this is the entrance i have built these two uh towers here using um dwarven forge pieces these are dwarven forge pieces but i've used uh roofs that brandon actually one of our players built for some castle walls that he created back in the day for dragon's bane actually um and I painted all of these uh, Dwarven Forge pieces, Forge pieces to match the ones that they've sent me that are pre-painted. So uh, Dwarven Forge is awesome, obviously. All in playable interiors and all of that kind of stuff. Hopefully nobody gets nauseous from uh, my shaky cam. Uh, this is the party, of course, we've got here. Um, all Hero Forge except for Esmeralda and the old Muskoka Mini that we were using. We've got the graveyard that the players uh, ignored, did not go to, uh, and I won't give away any um, spoilers as to that. But then if we lift off here and we come into the main kind of area here, these are also little uh, snow banks that I created back in one of my tutorial videos that you guys may be able to take a look at if you go back. But basically they're styrofoam, uh, like regular styrofoam, uh, and I have you cut them with an X-Acto, rounded them out a bunch, then hardened them, 
uh, by burning them actually and melting the top so it's hard and then adding uh, baking soda and water to the top for snow and that's it and then uh and then spray paint sorry i spray painted them first and then i added baking soda to give it kind of the snowy look this is the front area front gate with the uh fake guards on top of which we talked about and then of course over here we have the um garden with the scarecrow that exists there are two wings to the abbey of saint markovia Got the left wing, which is like the insane asylum sort of situation. And this here is where the abbot kind of takes up residence. Um, and yeah, I'm just taking a look through the chat here. All right. Okay, so this is the um, courtyard in all of its beauty there is a well in the middle there are the doors that lead kind of to the little shed areas we talked about there's a post where marzina was uh tied up to and then i have some ladders leading up to the walls and these walls are from the castle builder set from dwarven forge and i painted those those were all unpainted before i got my hands on them so let's start off here i'm gonna have to lift the top off this building so i'm just going to set down the camera for a minute and you'll be able to see kind of how the tops come off these buildings. It's pretty cool. Um, and I'm, again, I'm sorry for the horrible shaky cam, but um, okay. So we're just gonna do this. The nice thing about Dwarven Forge is, oh, not that, is uh, you can get these uh, big pieces and then they have these sort of uh, ceiling pieces. I'll show you in a second, but this whole top comes off. Uh, I'm getting, the cam is freezing here, uh, but I will show you the piece I'm talking about. And I will be disassembling the uh, Abbey tonight, but this is what I'm talking about. You can put that all on, and then when you lift it off, all of the all of the tiles come with it. Um, raise the roof is right, Gary Diamonds. Hilarious. Um, all right, so inside is, we only got a slight view or a very limited view of this when Muskoka kind of peeked up into this area during the stream. Um, but this is the upper area of the main hall. Uh, sorry guys, trying to, there we go. Upper area of the main hall. This is the body that was under a, a draped black thing. I won't say what it was, but there it is. Stairwell leading down into the main hall area. This is all done with our city, the city builder line from, uh, Dwarven Forge. Um, and then we have the, just like a chest. And then this, of course, is the viola player that is sitting beside the bed with all of these furs on it. Now, this bed, you may recognize, is from our first tutorial video ever, probably five years ago, where I made a bunch of beds. You can check that out on our YouTube page if you like. Again, I'm going to raise the roof, blow the roof off this joint real quick. Uh, it's all falling apart. It doesn't matter because I am taking it all apart anyways. I'm just going to do that <laughs> as it all collapses inside. One-handed, not so good for this sort of thing. All right. So stairway up, of course, Vasilica, who we used. She's actually a kind of a wanty uh, female from WizKids, but we use that. This is the unpainted priest uh, that I painted um, some time ago from WizKids. And then these are WizKids tables. This is Dwarven Forge food that you may have seen on our Instagram. Check out our Instagram if you want to see this stuff up close. I painted all of that. And then I also painted this fireplace from Dwarven Forge as well. This is where a lot of the action happened. This is where uh, Muskoka almost died. I totally just spilt juice on my plugs, which shouldn't be a problem, right? Not at all. That shouldn't be an issue at all. Electricity and moisture go really well together last time I checked. Okay. So I am going to pull the top off this side now as well. Uh, and these trees, I've had these trees for a long time. They're kind of like from model trains. And then I based them with some poster board and some uh, glue guns. I am just quickly going to wipe up <laughs> this spill here. Hilarious. Uh, make sure that I take care of that so that we don't have any problems. Like I said, I'm sure it's fine. No worries, nothing to see here. Good thing the camera's not on this area. So you can see how much of a klutz I am right now. All right. 
Jason, can we see the support? I've been meaning to ask how it is supported. Uh, Antipodian, can you just tell me what you mean by that? And uh, yes, I need a hat cam. Good idea. Um, all right. Okay. I'm going to move over to the other side here. Uh, you're talking about the support that holds, I'm assuming the support that holds the roof. Um, so yeah, so this is it here. It looks like this. It's kind of hard to see from that distance, but it looks like this. That's the support. Um, but to, for extra support on the other roof pieces, I actually used a large stone piece from the Erinthor Mountains um, range. And that is one big tile that I used for that, just for reference. Okay, so going to take the roof off this thing um, and I'll come back and yeah so that that's the support there that comes with the castle builder set it is that one piece and that is exactly what it's designed to do so I'm going to take the top roof parts this is just from city builder uh, I ran out of kind of tiles so these are just from the dungeons of doom set some more snow this snow is really easy to do you don't even need an airbrush for that blue. You can just dry brush it. I also created these little areas of snow with drips. The way I did that is uh, basically I cut transparency. So like overhead transparency, um, cut them in kind of like spikes and then dripped, sorry, I dripped glue gun basically onto a transparency and then cut them out. Um, into the shape that I wanted and then glued them to the styrofoam. And these just hang ever so nicely on the corner. And they are big icicles, huge icicles. Did some small ones too. See that? You probably hear Bruno in the background just going to town on his paws as usual. Okay, taking the top off this thing, let's take a look inside. Hopefully I can bring the camera around. Sorry guys, this is incredibly unprofessional, but this is what behind the screen is all about. Not un being unprofessional, that's not what it's about, but it is about uh, kind of, you know, anyways, you know what I'm talking about. All right, so this is where uh, the party came up through the floor. Uh, I've used this big tile from Dwarven Forge to hold this whole floor so that I could lift it up. It does defeat the purpose of having a stairwell, but it works well for other things. There was a door here, so if they had come up the stairs on the outside through here, this is actually from uh, Monster Fight Club. This is one of their bridges that actually has broken pieces that come off it. Uh, but this is where they came up. They saw Callie. Callie was painting the doorway here uh, and then came out. This is the hospital area uh, with the beds, and those are the rest of the beds that I crafted all those years ago. Then we have a barracks area for guards so that guards could literally go out this door here and then come down uh, when it used to be an old building. It doesn't necessarily function as a guard thing anymore. This is the morgue, I believe. Yes, this is the morgue. No, operating room, sorry. This was the nursery that the characters went into and I forget what this was. Operating room, nursery, morgue. That was the morgue. Uh, and that is the top floor of the Abbey. And save your questions. Maybe you guys can ask them after. I, I don't, I'm not near questions right now. So just give me a minute because I can't see what you guys are saying in the comments. But save your questions, write question in front of it or comments. And then the mods, uh, the Smith Guardians will add them to our to our Discord so that I can access them easily without having to go back through the comments. Okay. Now this area is fun. So uh, what the players don't know is they came through this area. Obviously this is where um, they went, uh, Callie went up and then Rectavio and Esmeralda followed. This is the broken office. But then each one of these cells, there are a number of mongrel folk that were in them at various stages of madness. 
Um, and they just kind of ignored all that, didn't go in to find out what was the deal. So that's pretty much the Abbey of St. Markovia. You can see how nuts it is. Uh, it uses the Dungeons and Doom sets, it uses the City Builder sets and the Castle Builder sets all in one. Uh, and it was a heck of a lot of fun to do. Uh, I had a blast building all of these. Um, and I cannot wait to move forward and continue to do that sort of thing. I actually have a dwarven, a, a, a huge load of dwarven night, uh, meaning the dwarven forge is sending me some more stuff for this season. Actually, uh, tomorrow it's arriving. It was supposed to arrive today. I was actually going to unbox it on screen, um, but instead it is coming tomorrow. So um, maybe we'll, un well, I'll show you what I got next week. All right, so that's it. Fun, right? Uh, I think I'll do that kind of stuff more often when we've kind of cleared an area. Um, and we can, uh, you can kind of get the inside scoop on some of the builds that we do, um, which are a heck of a lot of fun. Uh, I think that'd be a blast to do. Um, all right, back into the Discord here. I will get to the questions now. Uh, this portion, obviously, if you have questions about what happens behind the, sc the scenes of Realmsmith, anything to do with the way I run games, rules, calls, anything that happened in the last episode and leading up uh, in either season and the decisions as to why I did certain things, uh, if you have any of those questions, please let me know, and I would love to answer those for you all. Um, and that is the time. And then if we have some time at the end, depending on how many questions you guys ask, I will have some questions for you. Um, because we had a crazy amount of awesome role play and like, like a wow moments, I'd say in the last three episodes, I think the last three episodes have been some of my favorite of all of Realm Smith's streams. Uh, there has been some really solid role play interaction, integration, and obviously having Matthew Lillard and Nora together playing, uh, parts has been incredible as well. So that was awesome. All right. Jazzfall says, really enjoyed the tour. Thank you. You are so welcome, sir. All right. Here we go. New questions. From the D&D chat, Trope19. My party made it to the Abbey. I'm assuming this is from yesterday. I am scared to knock on the door of the Abbey after last Monday's show. Not everybody's going to run the Abbey the same way that I did. So just keep that in mind. Uh, I am changing things up a little bit. And for those of you that have played Curse of Strahd before or those of you that are going to run it in the future, you'll see that what I've done is actually quite far from what the book says. Um, so I wanted to make sure that I don't keep it all the same so that it's not super totally spoilerific. Um, so what I will say, though, and maybe I can tell you guys this. Um, spoiler, again, for those of you that are going to watch, or sorry, those of you that are going to play Curse of Strahd, um, you can cover your ears, but I can tell you now that they've left uh, the whole face thing of the abbot wanting or Irina's face, that was not in the book. That is not from the source material. He actually wanted them to help her, help him find her a wedding dress. And online, I watched a gentleman, I forget what his name is, but he suggested that th he needs her face. So that's something I added. Uh, so I can, I, yes, it's twisted. Yes, it's gross. All of that stuff, but I thought it would really have the effect that it did, because uh, getting a wedding dress, whatever, is is one thing. But uh, I thought that that would be much more Ravenloft uh, or Curse of Strahd than just getting her a wedding dress. It didn't make a lot of sense as to why he needed them to get her a wedding dress. So, um, Krause asks, is uh, Krause, uh is Jason going to use terrain to make a full replica of Castle Ravenloft? So. Um, I don't have enough. So there is a build in the Dwarven Forge uh, boards um, that shows how to build each level of Castle Ravenloft out of Dwarven Forge. Um, and talking to Dwarven Forge, uh, they actually didn't have enough to be able to send me um, because obviously they're printing stock all the time and so on So or, or creating. So they, they're sending me a bunch that I can do certain elements. So what I'm probably going to do is end up using the, the maps from Beetle and Grimm and then using Dwarven Forge for rooms that there are encounters in or like special specific areas. That's probably what I'm going to end up doing in the end. 
which I think makes more sense so that I don't have to have these massive boards. It would take a lot of time to bring it back and forth. Um, Sarah Finn asks, best advice for where to start preparing as a first DM or tips on how to balance combat adventuring to start um, or custom one shots. Um, DC Lasser uh, replied, D&D Essentials Kit is really good for starting and D&D Beyond is a new player guide. Perfect, yes. So the, the Essentials Kit is a great place. Uh, D&D has two Essentials Kits. Grab one of those, check them out. Dig into them and find out if there's things. Uh, those ad starting adventures are great for new DMs. Awesome. To balance combat and adventuring, for me, um, what you'll find that I do a lot is make sure that combat feels narrative. There's always a reason, narrative reason for combat, and there's no reason why we can't infuse narrative into the combat. Explain what happens. Explain the effects. Explain what the NPCs and the monsters are feeling um, during the combat. All of that kind of stuff helps to make it so that it's not just initiative step to initiative step, roll some dice, try and kill a monster, get some hit points off. It should never feel like I'm just taking hit points off a non-existent creature. It should feel like they're fighting and combating a actual creature. Uh, MJ Cook asks, was the faceless Vasilica spin from Lunch Break Heroes YouTube channel? I think so. Is that who it was? Lunch Break Heroes? I'm going to give credit where credit is due. And I am going to find out if Lunch Break Heroes, I think it is. It's a gentleman. He also does another one with like voices. Lunch Break Heroes. If you think you're hometown. Yes. Lunch Break Heroes is exactly where I got the idea for uh, Vasilica's face. Um, so yes, credit to uh, credit where credit is due. I, I took that idea and again, um, definitely borrow and steal for D and D. Um, everyone will say that including the, the creators of D and D in your own home games, take from popular culture, take from fiction, take from other, uh, modules, other games, uh, to make it better. Everything that can make your game better, do it. Beg, borrow, steal, doesn't matter. Um, because you want your game just to be great. Uh, you're not selling it. You're not making money off it, all that kind of stuff. So enjoy your game. Use what you did. And that's what I did. I borrowed that idea from, from Lunch Break Heroes. Question from Tam Good. So how surprised were you when Esmeralda cast Lightning Bolt on the bride, whose name I forgot? Flesh Golem? Vasilka. Uh, I was surprised and overjoyed because uh, she thought, Haha, I'm going to Lightning Bolt it. It's going to do all this damage. And it actually healed the equal amount of damage. That was a great moment. And I remember the look of all of their faces like, no, we just healed it. So good. So, so good. I'm glad that she did it. How many hours did you decide to, uh, to dedicate to setting up the Abbot? Interesting. Not long. Um, what I, so this is the process that I went through with when it comes to the Abbot. I thought a Deva, and I, I won't spoil too much because he's still there, but a Deva is a lawful good creature. And it is a celestial creature. In the book, it's supposed to be lawful evil. I have actually kept him lawful good. Uh, but he is twisted. Barovia has twisted his, his intentions. Bruno is just going to town on his thing. One sec, please. Please hold. Just getting my son to get Bruno. All right. Hopefully y'all didn't hear that because I was just yelling upstairs. Um, yeah, so how many hours? So what I thought was, as a celestial being of the Morning Lord, his intentions are still pure, as you can tell. But he just has an idea, and it's been twisted by the power of Barovia. Uh, and he's not quite firing on all, on all good cylinders or all uh, beneficial cylinders. So that's the, the approach that I took. And then I knew from the beginning of this adventure that I was going to make him... Kali's Deva. I was like, how can I tie it in? And then as soon as I read that the Deva, that the Abbot is actually a Deva, I was like, done. That is Kali's Deva. How crazy is that? That she has been brought to Barovia by her Deva, who's actually a bit of a twisted, confused Deva who is trapped here as well. So good. Anyways, I loved that moment. The, the reveal was great. The moment was great. And the character development was great. And I just loved it. How much time did I spend? I would say like 
I don't know, half a day, maybe like not even like a few hours, just kind of like, okay, so what are his things? What is he going to tell them from the information of the Abbot in the book? What I do is I read it all and then I take it from D and D beyond I copy it and I paste it into something called Trello, which I use. I've, I've, I looked at it actually in a separate, um, I looked at it in a separate video, uh, an earlier behind the screen, I showed it to everyone. Um, and, and you guys can take a look at that, but I gave them, you guys a walkthrough at one point. Uh, but the idea is, is that I just kind of took the main points and then thought, how am I going to approach this guy? Uh, and that's kind of how I decided to do that. Prometheus bound question. How long does it take to assemble a setup like this one? Oh, this took me hours. So two or three hours, I'd say. Um, and a lot of it is because I'm trying to figure out, okay, what pieces fit where, um, and not to mention the painting time. So the painting time was four or five hours. But I'd say an hour or two, I'd probably to kind of like put it all together, make sure that I kind of run it through, read all the parts, read the descriptions of the, the rooms so that I can fit all the bits. Uh, but it lasted three or four sessions, three sessions, I think, right? Um, which was great. Tam Good's comment is, yes, please really like seeing the setup. Cool. I will continue to do this in the future. Comment from Sakura. Uh, yes, that was cool. Thanks for all of your hard work. You're welcome. Uh, MJ Cook asks any update on if or when the subscription boxes will return. Thank you, MJ Cook, for asking. I don't know. The question is I don't know. The question or the answer, the answer is I don't know. Further answer and clarity to that is this. Um, we sent a note out to the Kickstarters already. Um, we're working on sending a note out to our current subscribers that COVID decimated that business. I will be completely honest. It's been incredibly difficult to get that business back up and running together because everything shut down. Our supplier shut down, China shut down, um, and uh, shipping times were difficult. And I know some companies were able to do it. That's great. We weren't. And it really affected us. And going three months without collecting subscriptions really hurt us financially. So that is the truth of the matter. Um, right now, we're focusing on making sure that we do good by the people who have boxes coming to them. So that's what we're focusing on. We're not focusing on restarting the business. We're not focusing on ramping up the business. We're really focusing on making sure that the Kickstarters get their money or their stuff that they wanted and that the box subscribers also get the stuff that they've paid for. So that is our main focus right now. I don't have an answer, unfortunately, on to on when they'll return, but who knows. Uh, S. Good Kai asks, do Josh and Julian help you with the builds or do you do the builds solo? I typically do the builds solo, um, but Josh and Julian are my plot team. So with Barovia, it's with Curse of Strahd, it's a pre-written adventure. So I run some stuff by them, but they're so busy doing some of the writing, creative direction and running the Discord that uh, they don't really help me too much with Curse of Strahd. What they do help me with, though, is, is uh, Tides of Wildmount because they know the world really well, and that is homebrew uh, for us. That is a, a written adventure that we're creating based on the guide to Wildmount. It's not a pre-generated adventure. So, yeah, I, I typically do these solo, and I like It's really cathartic for me to kind of go around and build and so on. Um, Turambar asks, what drove you to make Vasilica faces like that? So wonderfully creepy. Well, that's the answer is that I got the inspiration from lunch, uh, lunchtime heroes. Um, I, it's not lunchtime heroes. What is it? I just said it and I forget lunch break heroes. Anyways, great little thing. He gives lots of little ideas about what else to do. I took that from him and, um, and made it my own. Uh, Valison 87 says, please railroad the tides campaign north to the graying wildlands. I know, not a question, LOL. I love comments. Um, stay tuned because uh, we do have some awesome plans for Tides of Wildmount. It's going to be great next season. Uh, please explain in detail, did you plan the narrative of Kali and the Deva or did you just make them up as you proceed through the season? I made that up from the beginning. At the beginning of season one, I decide, I, I, I always think about what stories and how can I tie in different characters into the narrative do it all the time uh, and make sure that i can i can do that um and all of them have their ties callie's tie was the abbot so this is the not the pinnacle of her storyline but this is the part of the camp campaign that is focused on her and her backstory um and so that has been in the plan for a long time and i'm glad finally to reveal it to the world because it was pretty awesome <laughs> anomalous anomalous i always get it wrong zip uh Ask, uh, says you creepy amazing dm i love the face stealing horror 
<laughs> it was so good. And again, guys, I know it's not for everyone, but I've had a lot of people who have said, I don't like scary stuff, I don't like creepy stuff, but I'm really enjoying Into the Mist. So uh, I'm glad that we can also make it broad uh, audienced. Um, does that make sense? Um, Zalison asks, what settings do you want to explore in Wildmount? I finished Tides yesterday. I know I'm off topic. Not at all. Zalison, uh, I love answering questions about previous, anything you guys have to ask about Realmsmith. Oh, settings in Wildmount. Um, let me think that first about that for a second. So I love all of it, man. We have a hard time deciding between all of the wonderful things that you can do in Wildmount. There's so many areas. Uh, from Zadash, the Grain Wildlands. Um, all of that stuff is really exciting for us. But we are definitely going to, I can tell you this, we're definitely going to explore further than the Menagerie Coast. It will not take place in the Menagerie Coast the entire campaign. So stay tuned for that. Moose2271 asks, Years ago, my monk character attacked Strahd by doing a running kick and knocking him backward onto a wooden stake, going through his heart. We called TSR to see if this would kill him, and they said yes. Is this something you would consider to kill Strahd, or would you rather not say? I won't say because it could be a spoiler of how you actually potentially could kill Strahd. Anybody who's read the book knows, um, but I will tell you that in D&D lore, uh, you know what? This is what we're going to do. I'm pr I, actually, I don't know if... Let's look at vampires just for a second. We're going to look at some vampire stats. Uh, I'm assuming they're right in the back. I don't think they're in the, in the undead section. I think they're actually in their own. Uh, T-U-V-W-X. Here we go. Vampire. Um, I do love that Strahd Venzarvich is in... There's a little story about him in the actual monster manual under vampire. Um, I'll tell you, the vampire has the following flaws. Forbidden, so the vampire can't enter a residence. We know about that without invitation. Harmed by running water, the vampire takes 20 acid damage if it ends its turn in running water. A stake to the heart. If a piercing weapon made of wood is driven into the vampire's heart while the vampire is incapacitated in its resting place, the vampire is paralyzed until the stake is removed. So technically, a stake doesn't kill a vampire in 5th edition. I don't know about earlier editions, but in 5th edition, a stake would actually just paralyze a vampire if it's, if it's placed in, causing him to be uh, while he's incapacitated. And then they're hypersensitive to sunlight, and he takes 20 radiant damage when it starts its turn in sunlight. My understanding is that you need to attack a vampire until its hit points are gone. When he tries to turn into mist and escape, you have to continue that onslaught until it is dead. Um, yeah, so Misty Escape. When it drops to zero points, oh, it's, my players better not be listening to this. When it drops to zero hit points outside its resting place, the vampire transforms into a cloud of mist, as in shape changer trait, instead of falling unconscious, provided that it isn't in sunlight or running water. So if it is, it can't do that, and I guess it dies. If it can't transform, it is destroyed. There you go. While it has zero hit, po zero hit points in mist form, it can't revert to its vampire form, and it must reach its resting place within two hours or be destroyed. Once in the resting place, it reverts to its vampire form, it is then paralyzed until it regains at least one hit point. After spending one hour in its resting place, the zero points regain hits one hit point. So the way to destroy a vampire isn't with a stake in the heart. That just paralyzes it. The way to destroy it is to get it to zero hit points and make sure that it doesn't get back to its resting place within an hour or I think that's what it said or making sure that it is destroyed. So there you go. Um, useful information for all of you out there. Uh, Gary Diamond's question, and again, maybe it was the case back then that your monk kicked and TSR said yes, because maybe that's the way that you could kill a vampire back then. Not today. Uh, Gary Diamond's, will Christina be guest starring this season? I don't think so. I think Christina is going to be taking the whole season off, um, but she hopefully will be back for Tides of Wildmount. Zipf asks, any chance of getting the Necklace of Fireballs back from Roan, a special delivery from the Forest Spirit Children? <laughs> Possibly. We're working that out. Stay tuned. 
JC Elsie asks, are past behind the screens episode uploaded somewhere because Twitch eventually deletes older streams? I know we are going to work on getting all of our behind the screen scenes and all the player table uh, screens, scenes, all of the behind the screen episodes and players table episodes uploaded to YouTube. But we're going to try and make sure that we get that done so that you guys can catch them. Because I know I've been asked that a bunch. So also the Dragon's Bane, because I know people are going back and watching our our horrid, horribly produced older sessions. I love it. Uh, it's nostalgic and it took us doing that to get to where we are. But, um, and I love that you guys are doing that. It, it really warms my heart. And Apodian, keep strong. You know the community is behind you. We are here for whatever comes. Don't worry too much about the boxes. I'm sure you'll be able to bring them back when the time presents itself. Cheers from down under. Thank you, sir, very much. Roman Wolf asks, will they find Roan in Castle Ravenloft, NPC? Maybe, maybe not, you never know. That's good though. Villain Miniatures, after Into the Mist, what is next? Realm of the Frost Maiden? Good question. Um, we'll be doing Into the Mist probably for at least a couple more seasons. Um, it goes to level 10. And we don't want to rush it, so uh, we're in, in in we're in Barovia for a little while. Uh, I'm sure that'll be. Uh, I'm sure those that are a fan or fans of this show will enjoy that. Um, but we are looking at bringing more content, uh, and Frost Maiden is on in the consideration so of what we're doing. So uh, stay tuned, villain, uh, for that. Ed Tortuga asks, any plans for an Icewind Dale campaign? Good question, and maybe. Uh, stay tuned. Dishpickle. Uh, does Roan still have the turning, tuning fork? He does have the tuning fork. I will tell you, though, that as I explained to him, it's innate. It was meant for specifically for the purpose by the hags, but it is worth a bunch of cash, which he still has. Ah, soda stream, y'all. So good. Not a not a sponsor yet. Mr. Carrot, any other influences you have pulled from besides the campaign book to add to the Realm Smith version of Barovia? Uh, good question. Um, yes. So let me think. I, I did pull a bunch from Lunch Break Heroes. Uh, the faceless thing I did. Uh, I'm trying to remember what else, but there are, there are also the biggest thing that I add to my narrative and to my campaign kind of storyline is stuff that is specific to the characters. So things that I've infused so that the characters get their moments, um, so that it ties nicely into their ongoing storyline in the campaign. That's what I focus on the most. Uh, other little things here and there. Sometimes I'll change things. Again, the the uh, kind of the viewpoint of the abbot I changed. His alignment I changed. Um, I'm trying to think of what else I might have changed. I can't think of anything else off the top of my head. But I'll, I'll, I'll think about that and keep that in mind. Prometheus Bound asked, Is the Shambling Mound still in the player's possession? Yeah, it is. It sure is. That root is in their bag somewhere. Um, it absolutely is. That's great. I just saw, is Falfer still missing a shoe? Uh, that's so good. Um, that's so good. And then I do we'll see one last question I'll take from you guys. Um, and then I'm going to ask you guys some questions until the end of the show. We've got 20 minutes left. Um, lots of time. Any chance of you really making a Rictavio, you imbecile shirt? <laughs> yes, there is a chance. I cannot make any promises, but I texted Matt Lillard last night and I said, hey, bud, what do you think of us doing this? And he said, go for it. So um, there is a chance. I just, we got to figure out timing and resources and all that stuff, but there definitely is a chance. Okay, I'm going to ask you guys folks some questions now. I'd love to hear feedback from you guys um hopefully sirenscape isn't too loud this is still the hopeless village sound set i've also added some lunatic asylum sounds those are all the screams and the craziness that happens but you can get the the hopeless village and the death house sound sets at sirenscape if you go to sirenscape.com slash realmsmith and then type realmsmith into the search bar you will find those 
Um, uh, <laughs> Woohoo, I want it. I think maybe I'll do like a Rectavio holding his fist up saying, You imbeciles! I think that's probably... That's what I'd like to do. Um, that would be a lot of fun. All right, so questions for you folks. Um, from last episode... What was your favorite moment? And I like to, I'm probably gonna ask this every week because I like to know kind of leading out from that episode, what was your favorite moment of this past episode? This episode six of Into the Mist. Um, I think I called it a righteous misconception, <laughs> right? Um, and I'll just watch the chat here for your answers on that. Um, I will tell you my favorite. I think one of my favorite moments um, was when Esmeralda healed <laughs> the flesh golem. That was great. Um, I'm trying to remember it, man. It, it starts to become jelly in here. Um, the cliffhanger was fun too, uh, but I won't take away from you guys. I loved Mel's skepticism about meeting her diva. Yes. So, um, let me say something about Melanie and Callie in general. Uh, there are some comments in online and stuff about you know the fact that she doesn't know all the rules yet or, or kind of stumbles through the narrative sometimes uh, doesn't know how to role play uh, things let me say this folks um and i'm just gonna say it straight out we love all people who want to play DD. we love everybody but anyone who is willing to sit down at a table and experience something for the first time dig in and enjoy it we applaud um, and there are different people at different levels. I've been playing D&D, played through my whole uh, kind of, you know, uh, adolescence. So my teenage years stopped for many years and just came back to it four years ago. So I don't even know all the rules. And I have a hard time. I get dinged for that all the time online. Uh, Joel, same thing. Played when he was a kid, came back to it four years ago. Adam's been playing for a long time. Brandon's been playing even longer because of the stretch that he has. Dave's brand new. Mel is just started playing for our streams. So, you know, there is... Something to be said for allowing people to progress at the, at the stage that they are. The thing that I love about Melanie and the way that she plays Callie is the things that nobody else considers because she's playing it like it's a real life thing. Um, yes, she doesn't get the rules right all the time or, or doesn't know how to necessarily put to words her role play experiences sometimes. Last, session, last couple sessions were incredible. Her idea of painting uh, the floor to make it look like stone was brilliant. And you saw everybody on the stream. You just go, oh, that was a moment, right? And uh, I love the tenacity of new players that think outside the box because that is what they do. They don't try to game it. They don't look at stats. She, you know, if you asked her what her skills or stats are, she probably wouldn't know, but she just loves to kind of solve those problems and be at the table and enjoy what it is. And somebody said it best in our, in our comments because somebody had said something and then the other person said, well, you know what? Like, um, not everybody is going to be, role play is going to be their top thing or, or whatever. Um, they come to the table for different reasons. Uh, I love the kind of sass and um, the attitude that Callie brings, that Mel brings to the table. And again, some of the off the wall sort of things that nobody else expected. When people come to the table as adventurous for D&D, they think, oh, we all need to work together. Well, Callie, Mel, looked at the situation as one would if the person who spoke to you for their whole life, who, who led you to where you are today, who never really led you astray, who was your best friend when nobody else would be, is now asking you to do something that is counterculture to your new friend group. Super powerful, super confusing. And to be put in that position and act like she did was awesome. Hats off to her. She's awesome. That is the end of that story. So, yes. Um, uh, okay. Uh, let me go back up here. There was a lot of... I went on a little tirade there, but I will... Um, And remember, write comment on your answer so that while I'm coming through here, again, what was your favorite moment from last episode? And as I'm scrolling, I'll be able to see where it says comment. Comment in, in capitals and then write your comment. And if you said something and I haven't said it, make sure you write it again with comment. Um, 
me see here. Yes, we, we stopped and got uh, shoes for uh, another shoe for um, Falfer. Uh, where Callie dropped the dagger. So again, another po point. Where Call Callie dropped her dagger so that the people would know, so her party would know where she was going. Again, torn, not necessarily knowing. Um, yes, the oh, so the, the Deva, Roman Wolf saying the Deva getting more angry with divine fury in his voice, right? Um, that kind of divine righteous anger. Uh, and again, it's hard to know how to play an angel. Right, probably really calm, and that's why we, I tried to do his voice. Was very calm, speaking very calmly, but then getting angry when certain things would go against his goodness. Remember, guys, a good character isn't necessarily what society says it's good, or what society says, or the laws of the land. A lawful good character follows what their law is, and so for the deva, it's the morning lord's law. And then he's going to do good by the Morning Lord's Law. That's how I see Lawful Good playing out. Muskoka's face when you said 30 points of damage. Man, that golem rolled, rolled two eights on 2d8. Because there's 2d8 plus 4 damage. Um, yeah, not good. Not good. Um, so it gets two attacks at 2d8. Uh, two attacks at 2d8 plus 4. Rolled really high on all of them. Not good. Uh, I love Nora called shenanigans. Uh, uh, how Nora called shenanigans. Yes, of course. Um, yes, Dave is in the car. <laughs> I know. <laughs> he really wanted to play, folks. He didn't want to take a week off. And you know what? I give him I give him credit for it. Uh, favorite moment from Shadster was seeing Melanie really come out of her shell and RP her character. Agreed, right? Agreed. Uh, and another thing, too, to consider is you guys, you know, people never know what is happening in people's lives. D&D is a place where people come to kind of escape. And uh, people have said that Melanie kind of was, you know, was, was quiet in the last couple of weeks. And frankly, you know, um, nobody really knows. We're in a tough time right now um, with COVID and everything. And sometimes people just need to be at the table. Um, and we need to accept that and, and, and welcome it. And yes, we're on a stream, but we have to remember that we're people, normal people. Normal people who love D&D who just decided to play it for the masses. And yes, we're held to a higher standard. I get that. We hold ourselves to a higher standard, but we're still human. And we should be allowed to be human and act human, right? So. Um, the cliffhanger ending was my favorite also, Mr. Carrot says. Uh, I really wanted to give it to Mel. I will tell you, folks, I really, really, really wanted to give that win to Melanie where she thought about that thing and then he wouldn't notice and he would take off. I really wanted to give it to her. But as a DM, I have to follow the dice. Uh, not always. I'll be honest, right? I'll flub certain things if I need to to make the players have the best experience possible. Not against them, for them. Um, but I rolled really super high. He, he rolled like a, I rolled for the Dave at the end for an investigate uh, perception check, I think it was, and he rolled a 27. With a 27, he heard what was going on. So we did some research afterwards, and in my understanding of Knowles' just Marvelous Pigments is it becomes that item, and let, that, that whatever you're painting, it becomes that unless it is more than 25 gold worth of something. The stones wouldn't have been more than 25 gold worth. So it did become a thin layer of stone above the, of the, above the wood. That said, it's a thin layer of stone. You have five guards under there wearing armor. With a 27, he would have heard some sort of chink in that armor some sort of shuffle, some sort of noise under that thin layer, and that's what he acted on. Um, loved Lillard's line of like, leave now or fight two of us. So good, right? I love him. He's so good. I really enjoyed the inner turmoil of Callie. Mel's energy surpasses her knowledge. I don't care what she does. Doesn't know the rules. I love her role play. Awesome. Watching Mel really get into the story and the action going on. Yeah, when she stood up and she like held this, the, the edge of her chair and the table and she gets so excited. Love it. Uh, I'm a big fan of Mel. Her enthusiasm and smile are so contagious. I agree, Zip, but I'm biased. 
Uh, as a noob, I love your openness with new people on Discord and your tables. And frankly, guys, you know what? There are other streams out there that are pro streams that have pro people on them and actors and so on. Love those streams. We're not that stream. We are a bunch of friends. I have known everyone here uh, from three or four years. So I think I met Adam maybe three years ago. Uh, all the way to David, who I've known for 20 years. What well, 20 years I've known Dave uh, Morin. Uh, and of course, varying years after that. So um, I've known Joel almost as long as I've known Dave. So uh, not quite as long. No, more, more like 15 years, I think, for Joel. But anyways, we were just friends around the table, really enjoying a game together. Um, and yeah. And and having met outside of d and I used to work with Brandon um, at a um, charity um, for years. So anyways. I love when she gets excited and we get the yes, 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 <laughs> right? Uh, I love that about her. I adore it when she rolls good and jumps up shouting. She's so funny, Tim Good says. Uh, Day Crystal says, Mel's relationship with the Deva. I love her ideas. Uh, painting the floor was one of my favorite moments in the last episode. Zip says, I love you, Mel. Uh, she brings a, a much more modern aspect to the game, and I really love it, Gary Diamond says. Tam Good says, I don't either. Off the wall things are the greatest. Just checking back in to see the shaky tour is over. Sorry, Vicarious. I know it was bad. Um, if I do that, I have to find a way to get a camera that points in certain areas um, without shaking. I apologize for that. Um, uh, good morning, Zexus, who said he fell asleep. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, Mel's energy uh, surpasses her knowledge. I don't care. Oh, yeah. I read that already. Uh, Zalison also says, yeah, leave now or fight two of us. Callie hitting that natural 20. Uh, Muskoka, uh, so funny, man. Dave is just so natural. Um, Mikey says, don't change anything. You guys are awesome. I love the entertainment. After all, I'm from hockey town. We don't have any hockey. <laughs> Good point. Um, uh, Let's see here. Too many great moments to choose from, Tam Good says. Muskoka almost getting one shot by the Corpse Bride, right? Oh, Corpse Bride, that's funny. Um, your Ab Abbott voice is like butter. Thank you, Sakura. Appreciate that. Mel for the win. All the hearts. I was going to say Mel plays a bit like Laura Bailey from Critical Role. You just don't know what she is going to come up with. So true, Moose. Um, so true. D&D &D isn't about winning... From what I can gather, it's about playing and having fun. 100%, guys. That's exactly what it is. Mel's hair was subdued last session. Unleash her hair. That pseudo mohawk is awesome. <laughs> it is great. Um, she actually has a tattoo of a rose on her head. This side? But anyways, she has a tattoo of a rose uh, on her head, which is really badass that I'd love for her to unleash again. Um... The throwing the candle and oil and the fire going out. It's so funny. Um, so good. Oh. Well, it was an incredible episode. We've had three incredible episodes. So great, actually, that the wonderful Matthew Lillard, Shaggy himself, the dude from all those wonderful movies that we love, is coming back for a fourth. Loves it so much, he's taking time away from his family and from his um, responsibilities to come and hang out with us again. So that just tells you kind of how, how much fun and how great and how much, how much we love, um, what we do here, uh, every week and why you guys are so stinking incredible. Um, and again, the support and the constant outpouring of support that we get from you guys is honestly what makes us do what we do, um, so well. Love you guys. Make sure that you love and take care of each other. This Thursday, we have Player's Table with Joel Oje, as usual. And then Sunday, Noel's Marvelous Tutorials with Realmsmith. And then back for Episode 7 on Monday. So pumped. You guys have a wonderful night. Thank you very much. And morning, Lord Speed.